Leah Wilcox. I'm the Army of Women Research Project Manager at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today for the Army of Women Research 101 monthly webinar for October 2012. Um, today I have with us Carla Finkelstein. Um, Carla is an Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. Her current research is focused on circadian control of cell proliferation, tumor resistance to radiation therapies, regulation of gene expression by circadian proteins, and control of the metastatic process. And Carla is here today to present on her shift work and breast cancer risk study um, for which the Army of Women is recruiting. And we're really excited to have Carla talk to us today about her transition from um, animal models to research in human subjects. Um, but to get started with the presentation, we're going to um, do an introduction to the Army of Women, um, some of our processes, some of our success stories, and then how you can utilize the Army of Women for your research. And then throughout the presentation, if there are any questions, um, please feel free to type them in, and we will get to them um, maybe in between Carla and I or at the end. So to get started, um, let's see, make sure we can start here. To get started, um, the mission of the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation is working to eradicate breast cancer and improve the quality of women's health through innovative research, education, and advocacy. And Dr. Love's big mission really is to set us apart from other breast cancer organizations and really think outside the box. And our goal is to identify the barriers to research, to explore new approaches, and create new solutions. And one of the new solutions is the Army of Women program. So what is the Army of Women program? Um, the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation's Love Avon Army of Women program is a groundbreaking online initiative that was launched in 2008 with the goal of recruiting one million women to participate in breast cancer research. And we received generous funding from the Avon Foundation for Women to start up the Army of Women program, which has been, they've been an excellent partner in this process. Um, the Army of Women connects a variety of breast cancer researchers with women who are willing to participate in a multitude of studies, but especially those looking into the causes of breast cancer and how to prevent it. And all women and men over the age of 18 are encouraged to sign up, whether affected by breast cancer or not. And I think that's a really important point for us to make, is that we are looking for everyone. Um, and a lot of times, researchers think that all we have in the database are breast cancer survivors. But as you'll see on a later slide, the majority of the Army of Women members are actually women without a personal history of the disease. So the goals of the Army of Women are to encourage all women to take the next step in breast cancer advocacy and participate in research studies. And we want to get the women invested in the concept of research to find the answers. And to do this, and what really sets the Army of Women apart, is that we're forging a partnership between women and researchers to end breast cancer. And one of the ways we do that is for researchers who recruit through the Army of Women and they've finished a study and they have some preliminary study results, we'll schedule an online webinar similar to this one where we'll have the researcher share the preliminary results with the Army of Women and in effect close the loop of the, of the partnership. And these webinars have been very successful. We get a lot of people joining us and we get a lot of people um, watching the webinar online later. So with all of this that we're doing, we're really accelerating the research process by providing researchers access to a pool of healthy volunteers, and we're also educating women on the research process as well. So how does the Army of Women work? Um, women and men can sign up online on our website to receive email announcements of available studies. We collect some basic contact and demographic information, and then they're part of our database, and they start receiving our call to action emails. Um, we send these call to action emails for studies to the entire database. Um, and this is, I think, another important point to make. We don't send our emails to a specific population. We send them to everyone, regardless of their ethnicity, their medical history, their location, because we want these studies to get around virally. So even though I don't live in Michigan, my family in Michigan may be interested in participating in a study where they're recruiting in Michigan. Um, and if women are interested in signing up for a study, they can RSVP for the study directly through our email or our website. And then they go through an online screening. And then from there, we manage the subject list and the information is passed on to the researchers so they can contact the women for the 
follow-up questions or to do the consent and enrollment process. And as I was saying before, the Army of Women is a little bit different from other ways of recruiting subjects because we don't match women to the studies and we're not a clinical trial matching program or a tissue bank. So how does it work for researchers? Researchers go online to our website and register um, to gain access to the application process and to gain access to our current membership base of over 370,000 women. So we're able to help researchers in a couple ways. If you don't have funding for your research project and you're applying for a grant, you can apply to the Army of Women for a letter of support. Um, and later on in the presentation, I'll show you how to apply for a letter of support. But in terms of the process, you submit an application. It's reviewed by the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation staff. And if we think the study is an appropriate fit for the Army of Women, we issue the letter of support, and then we give you our, our pricing information to include in your grant. If you do receive funding, you can come back to us and submit a full application. So if you have um, a study that has been funded and it's non-peer reviewed, um, you would submit that study to us um, through our application online. We review it again at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. And then if we think it's an appropriate fit for the Army of Women, we pass it on to our scientific advisory committee. So our external scientific advisory committee is comprised of researchers, clinicians, and advocates throughout the US. Um, if a study has non-peer-reviewed funding, then we assign the study for review to two scientists and one advocate. And then if it gets approved, we move forward with the process. For peer-reviewed funded studies, we don't want to redo the peer review process. So we review it at the foundation. If it's appropriate for the Army of Women, we assign it to one scientist and one advocate um, from our scientific advisory committee. And then we go forward from there. Um, so how, uh, a little bit more information about how it works for researchers. Um, as I said, our scientific advisory committee um, is, is researchers, clinicians, and advocates. It was, before it was 40 members, but we're actually adding um, 13 or more members this year, which is really exciting. Um, all studies have to obtain IRB approval as well as additional IRB approval for online recruiting before a study was launched. So a lot of times, um, researchers come to us and they do have approval for online recruiting, but then they get our e-blast approved by their IRB before we send it out to the Army of Women. Over 90% of the studies we send out to the Army of Women are peer review funded studies, and we do have a cost recovery model of $1,500, and that's a one-time flat fee. Um, so in terms of a timeline, um, if approved, the average time to launch a study after an application is submitted is approximately 90 days. Um, and the time to launch depends on many factors. Um, one of those is the execution of our legal agreement, the Memorandum of Understanding. And then the IRB approval of the eBLAS, that, um, the time it takes for that to happen, is also, um, you know, has a role in when we are able to launch the study. In terms of the percent of applications approved, 67% um, of the applications we've received have been approved. And the general reasons that we haven't accepted the study to recruit through the Army of Women, um, it wasn't focused on breast cancer, it was a cohort study, and we are currently not helping recruit for longitudinal cohort studies, basically to avoid confusing our membership. Um, we don't want them to get confused about being a part of the Army of Women and then a part of a long-term study that's going on. Um, at this time, we currently do not help recruit for clinical drug trials. And then also, if a study is not appropriate for the Army of Women membership due to the eligibility criteria. And that is, um, for example, if a researcher is looking for women who have been recently diagnosed and maybe haven't had their surgery or started their treatment, we don't yet have a mechanism in place to identify these women. And so we generally um, shy away from those types of studies at this time because we really can't be much help to the researchers. Moving on, so a little bit of information, um, who are the Army of Women members? Um, as I said before, we have over 370,000 women recruited and a few good men. 70% of the Army of Women database have never had breast cancer, and the other 30% are survivors or going through active treatment. 67% um, have no first-degree family history, which is also interesting because you would think that 
everybody who signs up would have some either direct experience personally with breast cancer or maybe a very, very close family member, but just our information that we've received from surveys shows that that's not the case. 27% um, have one first degree relative who had breast cancer, and then only 5% have more than one first degree relative who had breast cancer. Um, in terms of our breakdown of ethnicity, 86.36% um, of the members are Caucasian, and then it goes down from there. Um, we continue to do outreach into the Hispanic, um, Latina communities, into the African American communities, and the um, other communities to really try to diversify the Army of Women a little bit further. Um, but, you know, 12,234 Latinas is pretty good if you're looking for women to recruit for a study. Um, but, like I said, we're still working on it and to increase those numbers. Um, in terms of the age breakdown, 23% are 18 to 39 years old, 48% are 40 to 59, and 29% are over 60. So some information about the studies that we've launched so far. Um, 68 studies have been launched since the Army of Women started in 2008. 45 of those studies have closed. And six of those studies actually increased recruitment due to the success they experienced recruiting through the Army of Women. So they actually went back to their IRB and got approval to enroll more women into the study, which was very exciting. Four of the studies um, have been recruiting on an international basis. 25 are recruiting women nationally. And 39 are more regional studies. However, um, many of those have multiple sites, which really helps with the reach um, in terms of reaching out to the Army Women database. On average, we bring in 1,500 new recruits every month. Um, two new studies are launched every month. And over 78,600 members have registered to enroll in studies. Now, that means that that's how many people have actually signed up to be contacted by the research team, not necessarily the number who have actually participated in the studies. Um, Following, we'll have some examples of some studies that we've helped recruit for. So an Avon Foundation-funded study, the BEAM study, a regional study at Northwestern and John Hopkins University, um, that study was looking for 400 healthy women. They wanted to collect nipple aspirate fluid, core biopsy, and blood. And this is one of those studies where they increased recruitment by 100 women due in large part to the Army of Women's support and participation. In total, we had 846 women sign up for the study. And 8% of those were ethnic minority women, which is a really great percentage. And the PI for the study gave us some feedback and said that the AOW was significantly, significantly more effective compared to their other recruitment resources. An example of a national study that we've helped recruit for is another Avon Foundation-funded study called Discovery of Early Markers of Breast Cancer, and that's being done at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And this research team is analyzing normal breast tissue from benign biopsies for evidence of DNA damage in the breast cells. And they're looking for women who had a benign biopsy and developed cancer, and those are their cases, and then women who had a benign biopsy and did not develop breast cancer as their controls. And they're investigating whether the presence of DNA damage can predict who will develop cancer later in life. So an example of the great response we've gotten from the Army of Women, we sent a call to action email for the controls on um, January 18th of this year. 1,300 women have signed up to date, and the research team has been able to enroll three matches per case for all but three cases. So we originally sent out a call to action for the cases. We had some of those women enrolled, and then we were able to um, do matching for um, the cases, which was really the researchers are very excited about that. Another example of a national research study is the uh, Coleman-funded study, the Jewels in Our Genes, at University at Buffalo. And this research team is studying why some African-American families have multiple cases of breast cancer, and they're wondering if there are undiscovered genes unique to African-Americans. So we started recruitment back in October 2010. Um, we got some women signed up, lots of people to contact. But then the recruitment slowed down a little bit, and the PI still needed some women to sign up. So the PI expanded the eligibility criteria for her study. We sent a new call to action email in February of this year, and we had 62 more women sign up. 
and 71% of those new signups were within 48 hours. So the women really responded to the new eligibility criteria and were very interested in participating in the study. And again, this PI was over the moon about the response from the Army of Women and said, you know, she couldn't have gotten the women she got for the study without our help, which is really great. So let's go on to Army of Women capabilities and some of the things that we've been most successful with. We can help researchers with um, recruiting women to provide patient-reported report health and clinical data. Um, we've been very successful with blood, urine, and saliva samples, um, having the researchers collected either at their institution via a kit mailed to Army of Women members, which has been very, very successful because you're recruiting on a national basis, you send out the kit, and you're really going to get a large response to that one. Um, and if the researcher is unable to collect the samples at their institution or doesn't have the funding to send out kits, we may be able to facilitate the collection through one of our partners. Um, we can help recruit women to provide ductal fluids. Um, and then in terms of tissue, uh, at this time, we can facilitate the collection of fresh, normal breast tissue samples, and that's through a partnership with the Indiana, um, the Coleman Tissue Bank at the Indiana University. Um, we have researchers who are able to collect core biopsies at their own institution, and that's great. Um, but if a researcher is doing, uh, collecting core biopsies for the study and doesn't have the capability at their institution, we have been able to successfully recruit women through the Army of Women and then have them go to the Coleman Tissue Bank for a collection event. And that's actually, Carla has used that for her study, and it's been really successful. Um, but at this time, we cannot facilitate collection of fresh tumor biopsy samples. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't have a mechanism in place to identify women who are just recently diagnosed and going in um, or just going in for a biopsy. Um, so we have been able to find women to provide their paraffin embedded tumor tissue, um, but no fresh tumor biopsy samples. Um, we do really well with the national studies and then the regional studies in major metropolitan areas as well. And we've also helped researchers enroll specific minority groups such as lesbians, Latinas, or African American women. Some of the feedback we've gotten from our researchers, 100% of our researchers would recommend the Army of Women as a recruitment source and would use the Army of Women again, and we're really very happy about that. 86% said the AOW was a significantly more effective recruitment method than anything previously used. And some of the specific strengths of the Army of Women that was, um, were pointed out to us, one was the low cost plus the high yield equals efficient recruitment. And this research team, they obtained 52 volunteers from the Army of Women and 22 took part in the study, and it was done within a matter of weeks. They had spent a year in clinics and obtained about the same number of women, but at a significantly greater cost in terms of dollar, dollars and staff time. And the researcher recently sent me the numbers, and it was approximately $1,500 per study participant for her other sources and $68 per, re, per study participant going through the Army of Women. So it was a great savings cost. Um, and another um, researcher said that online recruitment reaches a large amount of people in a very short amount of time. Volunteers clearly trust the Army of Women and are eager to participate in research. So I think that's a really great take-home message. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the health of women study. So we, as, as we've been talking about, there's all of these women who don't have a history, a personal history of breast cancer. A lot of the studies that we've been sending out are for breast cancer survivors. So they were saying to us, where is a study I can participate in? Um, and so the Health of Women study is the offspring of the Army of Women. And that was our answer to these women. And here is a study that everyone can participate in. So the Health of Women study is a longitudinal cohort study that will collect information from participants around the country and around the globe using the internet and mobile technology. And the study is being done in collaboration with the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation and then Leslie Bernstein at City of Hope, and we've partnered with Dr. Bernstein to ensure the success of the Health of Women study. And the Health of Women study is open to all women over the age of 18. We are also having men um, enroll in the study, and um, men have to be either at high risk for breast cancer or have had breast cancer themselves. Um, and again, for the women, it's open for both healthy women and women with, um, breast, who are breast cancer survivors. So we're looking for everyone um, for this study. 
So the goals of the Health of Women study are to examine the causes, treatment, and prevention of breast cancer. And participants are being recruited from the members of the Army of Women and the general public as well. And another unique aspect of the study is the data sharing model, and this is where all of our listeners might be interested. All the data that's being collected will be available to the at-large community, research community, through an online portal. So we're still working on this. The study only recently launched about a month ago. We've got over 20,000 people signed up already. Um, and so later on down the line, we want to have this online portal for researchers to access the data that's being collected. Um, researchers outside of the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation will have access to this cohort data. So we also are looking into later on if a researcher has um, a survey study and they want to get some information from the Health of Women study, um, the study will be reviewed by the foundation staff. It will also be reviewed by the Scientific Advisory Committee. And then if the study gets approved, we'll move forward and put that survey into a module of the Health of Women study. And that way, you know, if there's long-term follow-up needed, we'll have those women in the study. So later on down the line, that will be available. Um, we're happy to answer more questions about that. If you have any in-depth questions, um, please let me know, and I can put you in touch with our epidemiology project manager. And so the more researchers that have access to the data, the faster we can understand why women continue to get breast cancer and ways to prevent it. And no one really has ever set up a model like this. We want to bring together the public, the researchers, and technology. So just to summarize the Army of Women and the Health of Women study, we're really trying to democratize the research process and shift the paradigm. We want research to address issues that are important to the public. We really want to educate and increase scientific literacy and support. We've got you know, these women willing to participate, and so we want to let the researchers know that the public is ready and willing to participate in the research process. Um, and with the right support, the Army of Women model can be expanded into all other diseases. So to move forward um, with the rest of these um, slides, we're going to just give some information about registering as an Army of Women research and submitting your application. So I'll go through these a little swiftly, um, but please know that you will be able to have access to the slides after the webinar, and we will post a recording on our website so you can listen again and share it with any of your colleagues. Um, I believe most of you are already registered, but if you want to share this link with anyone else, um, we have our website to register on our website as an Army of Women researcher. Um, here's the page, and here's what it looks like, so you're able to um, Go to the For Researchers tab when you're going on our website, and then click on the Register Now page. This is what our registration form looks like. We ask for very minimal information um, when you're signing up to be a researcher with the Army of Women. So as I mentioned before, we help researchers if they're applying for funding and they're looking for a letter of support. So here's just some information um, about the letter of support application and what we're asking you for. Um, you would go into our your account. Um, click on the tabs, and I'll show you that in a minute. And you're going to enter the requested information. It's very basic, your contact and institution information, um, your pending funding source and the expected funding date. We need some information about the study, including the number of women needed, your inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then your project needs if you're looking for data and or specimens from the Army of Women members. So then you'd upload your requested, um, the requested documents. We ask for an NIH biosketch and a scientific abstract. So here's the page where you're going to go in to the researcher sign-in page here. And then you're going to go to the login page. So there you'll enter your username and your password. Once you log in, you're going to have an area where you can submit your research proposal. So you're going to enter the project title. And if you're applying for a letter of support, you're going to click on, no, you do not currently have funding for your research project. From there, you're going to enter in the requested information, like I mentioned earlier. And at the end here, the project needs from the Army of Women. And that isn't what the Army of Women program staff at the Dr. Research, Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation um, needs. It's what you need from the Army of Women members who are signing up for the study. So any sort of specimens or data or whatever you're looking for there. And then in terms of um, the end, you're going to submit your biosketch, submit your scientific abstract. And as a side note, in terms of technical difficulties, we are able to accept PDF files and the older version of Word, which is the .doc, 
but our system unfortunately is not able to accept the .docx file. So that's just a little tip there. And then in terms of the review process, you submit your application. It's reviewed by the Army of Women team at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. And if approved, you will receive a letter of support and a cost sheet. And in terms of the timing, we can review a letter of support application and turn around a letter if it's approved within one week or less. So there is a very short turnaround time. Um, the letter of support applications don't go through our scientific advisory committee. It just goes through the foundation. So that turnaround time is, is very short. So if you already have funding for your study, or we provided a letter of support and now you have funding, um, and you have IRB approval, you can submit an application to recruit via the Army of Women. So again, you're going to um, enter the requested information. Um, there's a little bit more information that we ask if you're submitting a full application, um, the primary area of study, your IRB approval status, and then contact information for your grants and contract officer. Um, we ask for a few more documents. You always have to do your bio sketch and an abstract. We also ask for the budget award letter, the complete grant application, and the IRB approval document. Now, if you've received funding and it's not from a grant that you applied for, you can instead um, supply your study protocol. And in lieu of a budget award letter, you can just provide a letter explaining where the funding is coming from for your study. Um, so in terms of just the screens again, this is where you're going to submit your research proposal to recruit through the Army of Women. If you currently have funding, you're ready to go, you click yes. And then it just again takes you through the process. You're going to enter in all your information, enter in your project study needs. And then here you're going to submit the rest of your documents. Um, and you're going to submit the application. Again, the study is reviewed by the Army of Women team. And as we mentioned before, it's going to go to the Scientific Advisory Committee for review. The number of reviewers depends on how you're, how you're funded for your study. So in terms of the recruitment process, um, once the um, study has been approved by the Scientific Advisory Committee, the email blast that will be sent to the Army of Women database is drafted and then IRB approved if necessary um, by your IRB. We include in the e-blast what the study is about, what's involved, who is conducting the study, where, um, and where the women have to be, and then who can participate in the study. And that would be the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, we also do the memorandum of understanding is executed, and we send the invoice for the $1,500 flat fee. Once the e-blast is ready to go and IRB approved, we send it out to the Army of Women database. Again, the women self-select if they want to participate. The interested women undergo a secondary online screening, and then the approved names and contact information are sent to the research team. The research team then proceeds with the consent and enrollment process. Um, and so that tends to, you know, we get a lot of responses to the eBlast right away, which is really great. Um, and we understand that it's sometimes hard to contact everybody who signed up right away. Um, but we do ask that researchers send an initial email to the women to let them know that their contact information is received. And it's great if that can go out within 24 to 48 hours of receiving the contact information. So that summarizes how you can utilize the Army of Women and what we've uh, successfully done already. Um, here's my contact information. You can reach me by email. You can give me a call. I'm happy to um, talk to people by phone and discuss any of the details of your project. And then you can also find information on our website, armyofwomen.org. Um, so I'm going to take a look before I get Carla started. I'm going to take a look at the questions. Um, and I think. Um, you know, a researcher wants to know if they have funding for the initial phase of the project, but is applying for more funding for the next phase. Can I get a letter of support while I pursue approval with the Army of Women, and how do I do this? Um, so we can definitely um, look at the application as two ways. Um, look at the application, one as a letter of support application, and another um, as an Army of Women application. And I'm happy to um, email you about this later on. So I am going to change the presenter and give control to Carla. And Thanks, she is going to discuss the study that we have helped her recruit for. OK. Let me see. Can you 
Can you hear me okay? Um, I don't see your slides yet. Yeah, hold on a second. You should be able to see it in a minute. Oh, there's your screen. Okay. Cool. Okay. You see this little... Oh, let me just... Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and thanks, Leah, for the invitation. I'm just going to go quickly through the research project for which we use the RV of Women. And um, in short, I have to say that uh, we're very happy and they have been fantastic and super helpful in our research. And you will see that in a minute. So the project for what I got funded, <coughs> funding was um, environmental risk of breast cancer development. And we were interested in understanding um, the molecular basis um, that actually in, involved in this, are involved in this um, um, breast cancer, uh, high breast cancer incidence, and um, how we can use that for prevention. And before I start into the details of the project, I just want to give you a, um, one slide or two slides summary of what this is about. Basically, we study how um, circadian rhythms influence breast cancer incidence. And circadian rhythms are the mechanism that keep our physiology and behavior running a 24-hour cycle. So bas basically, they are formed by three components, what we call an input signal, which can be light or, or change in temperature that basically synchronizes your, your clock with environmental conditions. An endogenous oscillator, that is a, a piece of tissue located on the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the brain, that actually integrates the, uh, the input signal and, and basically results in what we call an output pathway. And that output pathway is usually the secretion of a hormone or, for example, uh, melatonin or a locomotor activity when you wake up in the morning, or very many anabolic and catabolic processes that happen in your body. So one of the features of these um, circadian rhythms is that they are endogenous. And they basically stay even if you, if you, if you don't have any external cues. So, so basically, light, what light does is to synchronize your body to, to, to your daily oscillations. But if you don't have light, your body will still keep um, running in a 24-hour cycle. And, um, and they are cell autonomous, basically. If you take the suprachiasmatic nuclei of a person, or a rat, let's say, and you put it in a petri dish and, and you monitor oscillations, you will find out that um, oscillations continue. So why is that these circadian rhythms are important? Basically because they have been linked to a number of diseases and disorders lately. Uh, we know that they are rearranged by ship work and jet lag. Um, when you go to Europe, you have six, seven hours um, delay in your in your time, you have a time shift, and that usually causes that your suprachiasmatic nuclei needs to readjust to the time of the day in Europe. However, your your um, digestive system, for example, takes way much longer to adjust, like seven or eight days, and that happens because the suprachiasmatic nuclei, that is your master clock needs to send signals to the slave oscillators in your kidneys and stomach and liver to tell them that we, that you, you have been reset. So um, we know that that is usually the arranged when there is some uh, very serious shift work or in a jet lag situation. Uh, we also know that um, circadian disruption um, is related to alter insomnia and sleep syndromes. Um, they have been linked to a number of metabolic diseases, to regulation of alcohol consumption, coronary heart attack, uh, depression, and from the standpoint of my lab, um, they are important endogenous factors that contribute to cancer development and progression. And this has been um, shown through a number of studies, uh, mainly epidemiological studies, that shows that women working night shift, they have higher, higher incidence to develop breast cancer. And uh, the most recent article actually talks about a 40% higher incidence. And these are very, very large epidemiological studies. The studies done with um, something like 10,000 women, a cohort of 10,000 women follow over 10, 15 years. Um, this has been done with uh, night shift workers um, in factories, with nurses, with flight attendants, with telegraphers. And um, same results were obtained in different countries, studies in uh, Scandinavian countries, in US, some other places in Europe as well. So, um, so
So we know that this kind of shift work might be related um, to breast cancer incidence through some molecular basis. For example, animals that they are knocked out for various circadian transcription factors are cancer prone. So basically, um, you knock out one of these genes and instead of uh, developing an animal that goes to sleep early or wake up late, um, you do have something like that, but on top of that, develops spontaneous cancers. And those um, cancers are actually more, um, um, they arrive uh, more rapidly if the animals are exposed to some type of radiation or genotoxic stress. Um, there are a number of molecular evidences that talks about how um, clock proteins, protein from the circadian clock mechanism, actually interact with checkpoint molecules. And more recently, uh, a number of large-scale through output analysis show that 7% of all circadian control genes are genes that are um, that regulate cell cycle um, <clears throat> or apoptosis. So we hypothesize that maybe there is a link between the circadian and the cell cycle system that might be interlocked at some level and uh, might explain why uh, there is a very regulation of the cell proliferation process. So um, this might be true for some cancers, but not for some other ones. So we don't we don't try to generalize here, but obviously uh, it seems to be the case for breast cancer, especially for sporadic cases of breast cancer. So with this in mind, we um, we applied for a grant um, from the Avon Foundation to study this uh, how these environmental perturbations, meaning circadian disruption, influence breast cancer incidence. And <clears throat> to study this at the molecular level, we needed um, two groups of people. We needed um, um, women's, healthy women working day shift and night shift, and we also needed women that develop uh, breast cancer that they were um, night shift workers. So we, we start, uh, let, me, let me just summarize what we've been do doing for the, for the healthy volunteers here. Uh, basically what we needed is 25 um, day shift workers and 25 night shift workers that they were absolutely healthy and they work um, in their uh, shift for at least five years. The more years, the better it would be for us. So um, we basically didn't have absolutely any way to recruit these individuals. We are, our university is located in Southwest Virginia. We only have a regional hospital. Um, we were thrilled that the Avon Foundation actually uh, found our research interesting and helped us with this recruitment. So we contact the Army of Women, and we basically explained them the problem, and we told them that we already had funding support. So, so when I contact the Army of Women, I already had the grant in my hand, and um, and I was planning to use the Army of Women from day one. So I actually had a couple of sentences on my grant saying that um, I will use them as results for my samples. So um, I submit everything for review to the Army of Women, and they actually came back very rapidly to me, um, and I don't know why, but I, I was I was expecting that it would take weeks or something like that, and it, actually no, it was it was quite of a rapid process. So basically, what we, what we needed to do was to recruit the volunteers, get an IRB approval for this study, perform the tissue collection, and what I'm going to tell you is how the Army of Women helped me to solve three critical problems at the same time because. I wasn't an easy case for this for this group. <laughs> um, so I needed help from them to recruit the volunteers. I also needed help, uh, need help from them to settle our IRV for the whole study uh, because we haven't. Oh, I wasn't familiar with uh, the IRV process for for this kind of large studies, and I also need help from them for the tissue collection because there was no any way we can do the tissue collection in the hospital that is in our rural area, simply because um, they freak out when I asked them. Um, they were worried about liability issues, and uh, they didn't want to perform biopsies in healthy women. So um, basically, uh, from the recruitment standpoint, um, the Army of Women um, screen the, or you know, contacted all the volunteers and somehow were screened for my study. For that, we set a number of eligibility criteria that I'm going to go through in a minute. And they basically sent a large e-blast, what they call an e-blast, which is a large email, to over 300 
300,000 people and see how many of them enrolled for my study. So the Army of Women is, is located in LA, actually. Um, they uh, send this e-blast to over 365,000 women. And that e-blast, as uh, Leah mentioned earlier, there is some information that is very nicely written, uh, pretty layman in terms um, about what, 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 the stu what the study is about, what is involved, uh, who is conducting the study, where the study will take place, and who can actually participate. And um, this, this is um, really nice because um, within the uh, how is that you are eligible for this study, there are two main areas. One is what makes you eligible and what makes you uh, not eligible for the study. So we include both things on the, on the e-blast. It's a pretty large um, document. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a long um, email, but it's, it's very nicely written, uh, very layman. Anybody can understand this, and I think uh, it's one of the reasons because it reaches so well to so many people. So, um, oops. So the um, eligibility criteria include things, for example, like the age of the um, of the um, volunteers that was I was interested in recruiting for my uh, study. Um, then there were specifics in terms of the day shift or night shifts, for example. Um, like I said, I want to have people working mainly night shifts uh, for at least five years or even more. Um, I actually had volunteers they work night shift for. 15 years, um, they haven't have any um, problems in terms of uh, uh, their regular mammograms, um, they did check, um, and also we, we have some exclusionary criteria. I mean, actually, let me tell you that the eligibility criteria is like something like 20 different bullet points. I just picked some of them for you to show you. Um, the exclusionary criteria um, was was very strict as well. For example, in our case, um, taking melatonin will be definitely an exclusionary criteria because we don't want anything that could mess up your circadian clock. Um, or if you have history of breast cancer in your family, especially on uh, first degree relatives, uh, that could be a, s a sign of um, BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation. And we don't want to have that population in our study. We're interested in uh, sporadic cases of breast cancer. So with this eligibility criteria in place, we were able to recruit all the day shift workers within the first year. I mean, actually, to be honest, we, we, we received over 380 applications for, for only 25 slots in this study. I mean, it was that good. For night shift workers, we ran into more problems. Uh, we only recruit one in the whole uh, first year. Uh, let me tell you some of the um, eligibility criteria that we run into problems. For example, we have respondents that they meet all the, you know, all the criteria. And we have some other ones that they could be um, possible volunteers. For example, they, um, they meet all the requirements, but for example, they, um, they have had their uterus removed. So, so we, have a, we have a group of, OK, if we, don't, if we cannot recruit all of them, would this be a good volunteer for our day shift work? So, um, that work. And then we have some uh, people that uh, they definitely didn't qualify because uh, they fall in the category of exclusionary criteria. For example, some of them, most of them were people taking psychotropic medications and, and for a standpoint of messing up your circadian rhythm, that is certainly one of the um, uh, problems that you will run into. Uh, or people taking melatonin um, uh, or people that had um, a mammogram, but it was in kind of um, a not um, uh, under under biopsies. Uh, they're having a biopsies now, and we didn't want to risk. Uh, or some other ones that they have other situations, like for example, they agreed to be part of the study first, and they uh, were not able to come. So anyhow, so um, we end up with having all the day shift workers within the first year, only one night shift worker. Um, I contact back Leah and I uh, make her aware of this problem. And um, I have to say that they did something fantastic. They actually uh, kept going on with the e-blast e 
an update to absolutely all the 360,000 volunteers and see whether we can recruit more. But on top of that, they launched a national program to, to, to bring more people to my study by, by tackling other organizations. For example, they contact mother of preschoolers to request, to request their help in this study. They put sold in newsletter. They actually send information to them. They contact flight attendants and hospitals, and this was done by uh, Dr. Mark Hulbert from the Avon Foundation. He, he was very nice in, in helping us on this study. Um, really, everybody was um, was on board uh, and understood the, the importance of the study. Um, the nursing association, um, there were postings in absolutely any single social network that you might imagine. Um, then. Um, Leah also contacted um, hotels, uh, the Metropolis Station, the Metropolis Office, the fire departments, hospitals, uh, community hospitals, labors, union labors. Um, I mean, I, I can't thank enough these this people for their uh, efforts to recruit my, my night shift volunteers. Despite all this work, we didn't get much more, much more volunteers, so we, we talked back with, um, we have a discussion with the Army of Women staff, and we decide to, um, to loosen a little bit our eligibility criteria. So we moved, for example, um, I, I was a little reluctant to do that, but um, um, uh, turned out to be the right thing to do, actually. So we moved, for example, the age of the people that could apply to this study from 30 to 4, 54 to 30 to 65, as long as they have normal mammograms and daily mammograms, and, um, and uh, we just lose this other point regarding the night shift. Most of the people that applied, they thought that they needed to have five years of night shift done right now, so we just add that it needed to be done, um, need to be done at some point in your life. Um, and then we also um, uh, requested that um, uh, within the exclusionary criteria that they shouldn't have any beta-1 bracket two mutation. So when we lose these um, three factors, um, really we got like six night shift workers only in the first call. I mean, that is unbelievable. It's, it's really a lot. And by now we have pretty much half of the whole um, study complete. So uh, there was another problem. So this is the way that they, what I told you so far is the way that they helped me to recruit the volunteers for my study. Um, the other problem that I have is that I didn't have a physical place where to perform the biopsies. We are talking about healthy women, so they're going to come to a place and they're going to say, well, you know, I'm going to donate this tissue for your study. So I need a biopsy. So I passed that problem also to the, uh, to the Army of Women, and, and I have to say that I'm glad that they didn't hang the phone. And um, they actually contacted me with um, um, Susan Clare from, from the Common Tissue Bank. And uh, we all three of us um, kind of figured out a way to organize this study in which uh, me from Virginia, right here, Southwest Virginia, contact the Army of Women. Uh, they recruit volunteers uh, through this massive call. They actually go to Indiana. Um, and these volunteers were mainly from, the ones that are set to participate in this study were mainly from Indiana or surrounded areas, and get their biopsy done at the Common Tissue Bank in University of Indiana. And then the sample is shipped to me um, via FedEx overnight. Um, basically, the Common Tissue Banks obtain a stores the specimen. Um, there's a breast surgeon there that performs the biopsy and it's an outpatient procedure. Uh, samples are coded, um, and our IRB is a monster IRB, and all these coded samples, they come back to me for analysis. So that brings the IRB, which is another area, like I mentioned before, our Army of Women helped me on, helped me on the recruitment, helped me on the, um, on the um, uh, tissue collection, and now I'm gonna tell you how they helped me with the IRB uh, uh, application. So um, this IRB involves work in three different states. So uh, for us in Virginia, the Army of Women in California, and the Common Tissue Bank in Indiana. So the Army of Women send the e-blast. Um, all the women that apply and they qualify for this study, 
are selected through a phone script that is performed by um, our group here in, in Virginia Tech. Um, we, we have a consent form that needs to be signed and there's a questionnaire that is 17 pages questionnaire we send to these women and then when they return the questionnaire we, we actually check for its eligibility uh, in, in more depth. Uh, while the women is actually accepted for the study, uh, we have a final yes on this decision. These women need to sign up for tissue collection at the Common Tissue Bank in Indiana, for which we, there is a memorandum of understanding with the Army of Women. Uh, we did an MTA for tissue collection. There is a consent form that comes from, from them. And uh, there is a number of um, paperwork related with the way that the biopsy will be taken. So all this work was really um, coordinated um, with three groups, um, the Army of Women in California, um, the group of Susan Clare in, in Indiana, and ourselves in Virginia. And um, because of the work, the previous links that they have between the Army of Women and the um, Common Tissue Bank, that part was kind of already said. So really what was needed was to add us to the study. So um, it was a very complicated study, it turned out to be very good. We almost have all the samples. Um, the longest uh, process was really the IRB approval because it was something that nobody did before, at least in our institution. Uh, but this couldn't be possible without the willingness of everybody to help. So I'm in, in depth to uh, uh, Dr. Susan Love and especially to Leah that worked uh, really crazy to, to help us. Um, people from the Common Tissue Bank, uh, Dr. Susan Clare and Jill Henry were fantastic and very flexible in, in uh, helping us in this study. And Dr. Mark Herbert uh, from the Avon Foundation who didn't need to help as much, uh, but he, when we ran into trouble, he actually was the first one to, to, to jump and try to use his connections to help us with the recruitment. And of course, I absolutely in depth to all the women that actually end up uh, volunteer for this study. Well, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Carla, so much. That was fantastic. Um, I think that this is just such a great example of how the Army of Women can help researchers who are, have a great study idea and don't necessarily have the means to carry it out and that we're available to help with that. And as we've talked about, we really want to help shift the paradigm of research and get researchers out of animal models and into some, you know, studies with women. And so we really want to be a resource for them and help them through the process, as you said, with the IRB and getting studies up and running. So if there's researchers out there who have a great idea and need some help with it, they are more than welcome to contact us um, and we'll be able to have a discussion about that. Um, so please go ahead and type in your questions. If you have any questions about the Army of Women, please, or if you have any questions for Carla about her study. Um, we did have somebody asking if it would be possible to get access to triple negative samples. And I guess my question um, for that researcher is just, are you looking for paraffin embedded samples, or are you looking for um, fresh tumor biopsy samples? Um, because as we discussed earlier, don't really um, have a mechanism in place right now to reach out to women who are going in for biopsies. And so if you're looking for paraffin embedded samples, then you know we can definitely discuss that further. So if that person would like to email me um, separately, that's great, and I'm happy to um, answer questions about that. So I'm going to change the presenter um, back to me just so that I can show everybody um, my contact information again. So here it is, it's available. Um, please feel free to email me or um, uh, give me a call and um, we can discuss any of the questions. So I don't see any additional questions right now. I guess I would just ask you, Carla, um, in terms of, oh, we have a question. Um, so uh, one of the attendees is asking if it's possible to share data with other researchers. For example, if someone else has collected saliva, I could genotype those samples and share the data. Unfortunately, at this time, we don't have that set up. Um, with each of these studies, it's separate. The researcher has, you know, control of those samples, um, and so we aren't really able to connect any of the researchers together. Um, but it's definitely something we can think about in the future. And I think with the health of women study, too, that um, 
they would certainly like to use it as a way to, um, you know, have women be participating in studies outside of the health of women studies. So that could be a possibility um, later on down the line. Um, but right now, we just we aren't really um, putting researchers together in terms of you have saliva samples and I can genotype them. Um, but it's definitely something that we could think about. And if researchers are interested in being um, contacted by other researchers, we're happy to, to make that connection. All right. Um, we'll see if there are any other questions. Uh, um, but in the meantime, I guess, um, Carla, if, is there any advice you could give to researchers who have a study idea and are interested um, what are some of the biggest hurdles to overcome? Is it really, you know, the IRB process, um, or what no, were some of the? Actually, the really big problem for us, uh, the IRB, end up to be a bureaucratic thing, right? I mean, at the end, it's a matter of uh, filling papers and having everything done, and with you, your help, has been no problem really. Um, right. The really, the really big problem is to to reach the people. I mean, one thing that it makes, uh, I think, that women. Oh, fantastic! It's the fact that people that sign in is people that really want to help and donate, and is willing to donate whatever fluid or tissue we need for our studies. So being able to reach over 350,000 people and uh, and find all the ones that we need for our study is probably unique. I mean, you don't you don't get that in any other way. Especially, for example, in our case, we needed a, a fresh tissue of Kathy volunteer for some proteomics studies. So uh, there was no any way to, to do that in any, uh, you know, getting samples for any other uh, tissue banks because there were no fresh samples. Um, most of the samples from other tissue banks, they don't even have records where the person is a night shift worker or day shift worker because those were not normal questions to ask. So, uh, so it was like creating a whole set of a specific samples for this study. And the only way to do it is by reaching a large number of, of volunteers and this I don't see any other way to actually do it I think that is really the big access great yeah and I think that like you said with your study and some of the other studies that I talked about during the slide set was you know like you're saying these women are willing to do core biopsy samples they're willing to do nipple aspirate fluid and these are women without a history of breast cancer who are willing to provide these samples yeah. to researchers for their studies. And I think when you have that type of resource available, that it's just a shame not to take advantage of it. Because we've got all these women who, you know, we'll send out an e-blast and we'll get responses from the women and say, I keep looking, I'm waiting for my study, I can't wait yeah, to yeah. participate. Exactly. So uh, can they're I add definitely one more thing? available. Um, I would like to add one more thing, Leah, and it's that we didn't, we didn't pay to any of the participants in this study. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you send the e-blast, uh, they volunteer for the study, and we didn't pay any cent for, for, you know, to the volunteer itself for participating, which is sometimes very uncommon. Um, in addition, we don't pay any extra money to the common tissue bank. Um, so uh, it has been... Um, a really great tool for us to, to actually collect the, the samples that we needed for the study. I, right. I, I mean, there wouldn't be any other way to do it. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And I think, too, like you say, you you pay the Coleman Tissue Bank for the core biopsies, but that's it. There's no yeah, additional exactly. fees involved. So no, exactly. um, I think that, you know, works out really well for everybody. And, and for anybody who's looking for um, normal tissue, the Coleman Tissue Bank is definitely a resource. But I think one of the things that Carla pointed out that's so important is that, you know, they're not asking necessarily about shift work. And so what works really well is that we're able to identify the women that are qualified for Carla's study and then send them along to the Coma Tissue Bank. And those women donate samples for Carla's study, and they also donate samples for the Coma Tissue Bank as well. So it's really a win-win-win all around for everyone. Yep. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions or follow-up information. And Carla, thank you so much for presenting today on your study. I think it's a really great example of the Army of Women and how we can help researchers. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me. Great. Thank you, everyone, um, and have a great day.